the seven deadly sins. They exist in each of us. These are death-dealing sins. They will have a severely damaging effect on one's spiritual life. Lust, envy, gluttony, sloth, greed, anger, and pride. According to Christian theology, committing these deadly sins is as simple as thinking about them. Scripture says the wages of sin is death. Each of these sins has a secret history revealing how they came to be deadly. The seven deadly sins have had an enormous impact on history, society, and our souls. You cannot transgress God's moral law without someone paying a terrible price. And the deadliest sin, the one that kills, is anger. The seven deadly sins are an important Christian concept, yet they do not actually appear in the Holy Bible. They first appeared in the deserts of Egypt, more than 300 years after the New Testament was written. In about 375 AD, a monk named Evagrius Ponticus retreated to a Christian monastery. There, he began to catalog the temptations to the human soul, creating a list of the most dangerous. Evagrius believed he could narrow the list to eight terrible temptations, and anger was the deadliest. Evagrius believed that anger's greatest evil was that it blinded men. He wrote, an angry man cannot see the light, and the prayer of an angry person is an abomination. The seven deadly sins would not be codified until 590 AD, when Pope Gregory the Great re-examined the list of Evagrius. He narrowed the list to seven, changed their names from temptations to sins, and proclaimed they were deadly. To Pope Gregory, anger was not only sinful, it was costly to the soul. He wrote, anger is an expensive luxury in which only men of a certain income can indulge. Anger is defined as a desire for vengeance. The Bible describes the effects of anger numerous times. And three different biblical stories actually reveal the evolution of the sin of anger. In Genesis, the first book of the Old Testament, or Hebrew Bible, no one seems angrier than God. In chapter 6, God is at his angriest at his greatest creation and decides to wipe the slate clean. He sends a terrible rain and flood to earth for 40 days and nights, declaring, every living substance that I have made, I will destroy from off the face of the earth. God allows only one righteous man and his family to escape, Noah. Then in chapter 11, God unleashes his wrath again, only this time God is more precise and tempers his anger. The people of Babel build a tower to heaven. God finds this offensive and angrily destroys the tower, scattering its people throughout the world. Instead of killing all the world's species, God only punishes mankind. God becomes really mad sometimes, and watch out when he gets mad, because people are destroyed and families are obliterated. Finally, in chapter 18, God finds fault with humanity again, but this time he only punishes the sinful cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. An angry God rains down fire and brimstone from heaven. God localizes his anger. He has evolved from punishing all creatures to just mankind, and then ultimately just the residents of Sodom and Gomorrah. There is a message to be found in God's wrath, according to theologians. I think that God's anger is a way of expressing that God has an intense involvement 
in the way human beings live their lives. In the same way, parents get angry when their children do something wrong. These stories that have to do with how do we live together in society, it's a form of crowd control in a way to direct people toward proper kinds of activities and to explain the events that are going on around them for good or for ill. The Old Testament is full of accounts of human brutality and atrocities. The murder of Abel by Cain in Genesis. King Saul's attacks on David in the book of Samuel. These stories aren't for the faint of heart, but they are meant as object lessons about the deadly consequences of the sin of anger. The second book of the Bible, Exodus, introduces the Ten Commandments and marks a seismic shift in how sins are perceived. The great innovation of the Ten Commandments and the thing that distinguishes them from the pagan cultures that predated the Bible is that God cares how I treat you. In pagan cultures, God cared how I treated God. In Judaism, and subsequently in Christianity, my relationship to you is my relationship to another image of God. And sin is a violation against God, whether it's directed against God or it's directed against you. The fifth commandment reads, thou shalt not kill. Religious scholars view this as a clear message from God that the sin of anger has serious consequences. Ironically, the bearer of the Ten Commandments, Moses himself, is a very angry man. In Exodus, Moses witnesses an Egyptian beating a Hebrew slave, and Moses kills the man in a rage. Later, on Mount Sinai, Moses returns with the two stone tablets of God's testimony and finds the Israelites worshiping a golden calf. He becomes angry and breaks the commandments to pieces at the foot of the mountain. And it's this very kind of anger that if it is allowed to go out of control can be very damaging. In this case, it's damaging enough to destroy the tablets. So they've got to be replaced once again. In each case, God does not punish Moses, but uses his anger to teach him of the pitfalls of the sin. It becomes interesting in this particular story to see that Moses is angry because it is a part of the human experience. We all become angry at times, and to stifle that or deny that is psychologically unhealthy and is unrealistic. So for Moses to be angry at a time like that is perfectly human. The Old Testament's view of anger is best reflected by traditional Judaic understanding. In the Hebrew Bible, the sin is what anger leads to. So when anger leads to cruelty, or to violence, or to oppression, or to persecution, then anger is a sin. But when anger is just an emotion that is felt by an individual and leads to no consequence, it is painful and powerful, but not sinful. The sin of anger would get a new twist in the Christian Bible. One of the first stories of the Gospel of Matthew concerns the king of Israel and the terrible consequences of his anger. The Gospel tells the story of the birth of Jesus, but Herod, the king of Jerusalem, learns that a prophecy says the new king of the Jews has been born the possibility of a rival to the throne sends Herod into a rage. Herod is angry because he is concerned for his own rule, because there might be a king of the Jews he heard that was in fact born somewhere, and when he was not able to find out about this, he simply flew into a rage and began to slaughter all of the babies who were of that age so that he could get at the one who might be the pretender to the throne. The story has been called the slaughter of the innocents. The gospel states, Herod slew all the children that were in Bethlehem and in all the coasts thereof from two years and under. Jesus only survives because his family flees to Egypt. Of course, any account that has to do with the slaughter of babies is so horrific in our understanding that we have a particular kind of revulsion to that kind of account. 
At the same time, a new vision of sin and its source was emerging in the Judeo-Christian tradition. What could cause a person to commit the incomprehensible evil of killing infants? The answer for the faithful was Satan. Satan is a vague and shadowy figure at first, but by the New Testament, the figure has evolved into a much more terrifying force, the tempter of mankind, the source of all evil in the world. Satan in the Old Testament is a rather minor character. Satan in the New Testament is more of a demon extraordinaire. Satan becomes the father of lies, and Satan is the one who lures us to sin. Among Satan's greatest temptations are rage and vengeance. Satan meets his mortal enemy, Jesus, who brings a new commandment about the sin of anger. The seven deadly sins are thought to be the gateway to hell, and the most violent and bloody of the sins is anger. In the Old Testament, it is God that is angry, saying in the book of Deuteronomy, vengeance is mine. In the New Testament, the figure of Satan emerges as the demonic incarnation of sin, especially the sin of anger. The counterpoint to Satan's rage comes from Jesus, who took a radically different approach to the sin of anger. Jesus seems to take the commands, such as the Ten Commandments, and he seems to ratchet up the intensity. Sometime around 30 AD, during his Sermon on the Mount, Jesus encouraged his followers to turn the other cheek. It's surprising advice, especially to a Jewish society being repressed by a brutal Roman occupation. He's giving them a way to respond with dignity and self-worth in that kind of a context. And that's why from Tolstoy, through Gandhi, through Martin Luther King Jr., those kinds of words have been words that have been deeply motivating as a way to allow people to express themselves with dignity and with strength without resorting to anger and violence. Jesus, it seems, refused to give in to the sin of anger, even as the Romans tortured and crucified him. The wrath of God evolved to its divine opposite. Instead of calling for righteous vengeance, Jesus, with his last breath, whispered, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. It's a powerful moment to think of an innocent person who is suffering in torment on the cross. It's an incredible kind of statement about how we might be able to rise above vengeance and rise above anger. The condemnation of the sin of anger is not unique to Christianity. Every single religion in the world labels rage a major transgression, although each has its own unique perspective. A rabbinic statement about anger is that anger is like a boiling tea kettle. Once it overflows, you have no idea where it's going to run or who it's going to burn. Anger is considered a major sin in Islam. The prophet told his followers that the best of you is the one who takes the longest to get angry, and the worst of you is the one who takes a long time to get over the anger. Within Christianity, there are differing opinions on the sin of anger. In Protestant land and in our history, anger can be a sin. It's not a sin in itself. It's what you do with it. The church says that we all have passions. Passions lead to sin. You cannot destroy passions or kill passions. The passions are to be purified redirected and transformed. And all versions of Christianity agree on one thing. Sinners who do not transform their anger are doomed to hell. Hell eventually became the counterpoint to heaven and the eternal home for the sinful. 
Most believe that Jesus was referring to hell when he spoke of Hades. But in the New Testament, Jesus spoke of the place of damnation with the Hebrew word Gehenna. Originally, Gehenna referred to a garbage dump outside the gates of Jerusalem where people burned their trash. Jesus used the word as a symbol of the fiery fate that awaited all sinners. You can have your joy today, but what happens after you die? The concept of hell evolved as a powerful symbol of retribution. In fact, different religions developed their own ways to define and explain the function of hell. So a Protestant view of hell is not so much that God is roasting people over a fire because he's angry. It's something much more sad. It's people keep falling in on themselves forever and ever. The Eastern Orthodox Church takes a philosophical approach. The Eastern Church says that God sends no one to hell, that hell is self-imposed. One of the greatest teachings of the Eastern Church is eternal mercy and compassion, as well as justice. In Islam, hell is not an eternal destination, but a learning experience. The Quran does describe hellfire as unpleasant, but there's a psychological element as well. It's an opportunity for us to overcome our shortcomings, to grow in our character, as unpleasant as it may be in hellfire, until the point that we are purged from hell and enter into heaven. Perhaps the most vivid depiction of hell was penned in 1320 AD by the Italian author Dante Alighieri. His intense and elaborate portrayal of eternal damnation would capture the imagination of the Christian world. In The Divine Comedy, Dante describes his journey as he descends into the nine levels of hell. Some of his descriptions of hell are so vivid that they've captured the imagination of people for many years. Dante's journey is terrifying because he witnesses the penance for each deadly sin. In every case, the punishment fits the crime. The sin of anger is found on the fifth level, in the swamp-like water of the River Styx. Here, the wrathful are ruthlessly beating one another as they try to pull themselves from the river. Dante witnesses their angry attempts to tear each other limb from limb. Dante's vision of hell guided Christian thought for centuries, even though most of the details came from the poet's mind and not from scripture. The Christian interpretation of hell would evolve again when medieval demonologists began cataloging hell's citizens. In 1589 AD, German bishop and witch hunter Peter Binsfeld compiled a detailed hierarchy of demons. He believed that each of the seven sins was associated with a particular devil. Binsfeld wrote that the demonic prince of the sin of anger was named Ammon. Ammon was probably a corruption of an ancient Egyptian sun god, Amun, worshipped among the pyramids as far back as 1550 BC. Binsfeld described the demon of anger as a flame-spitting monster with a raven's beak and the tail of a serpent. He tempted men with power and destroyed them by their own wrath. But Binsfeld thought there was another demonic entity who also controlled the sin of anger. He believed the chief demon of anger was none other than the mighty king of hell, Satan. Anger is connected to Satan. Anger that is misdirected can lead to violence. It can even lead to murder. And so it's probably our most powerful emotion. And so it's no surprise that wrath is connected to Satan. Because of all the demons, Satan is the most powerful. For centuries, the fear of Satan and damnation were central to society's understanding of sin. In today's world, some believe there is little relevance to these ancient concerns about the power of hell. 
we all know a little bit more about the nature of the universe and what is up there and what is down there. There are those who believe the sin of anger has led to a man-made concept even more diabolical. The real-life incarnation of hell on earth, war. The seven deadly sins do not appear anywhere in the Bible. Yet the church developed them to codify acceptable behavior among the faithful. The sin of anger is the deadliest, as it can lead directly to violence, bloodshed, and death. As the sin of anger evolved in religious history, it remained part of human emotions. The whole question about anger has to do with how can a natural emotion ever be considered a sin? And the Bible uh, will say it's one of degree. For humanity, the most dire result of the sin of anger is almost certainly war. Well, I think anger definitely does cause war. I think it also uh, prolongs war because it generates a chain reaction that can sometimes know no end. The connection between anger and war is actually older than the Hebrew Bible, dating to one of the oldest pieces of literature in the world, the Iliad. The Iliad is the story of the Trojan War. Tradition states the epic poem was written by the Greek poet Homer in approximately the 9th century BC, but it refers to events that may have taken place 200 years earlier. The very first word of the tale reveals its theme, wrath. It's about the wrath of Achilles and what Achilles did. And that wrath that comes to expression in power and in significance, but also leads to his own destruction. As the epic unfolds, the Trojan War has ground to a halt because of the anger of the Greek hero Achilles. But he is not angry at the enemy. Instead, he's angry at his own commander for taking away a beloved slave girl, Briseis. Achilles withdraws from the fight, leaving the Greeks to suffer terrible defeat. It is only when Achilles' best friend is killed that he refocuses his anger and rejoins the battle. For centuries, the tale of the Trojan War has been a lesson in how the sin of anger clearly leads to selfishness, dishonor, and eventually death. In 480 BC, a later generation of Greek warriors would take this lesson to heart. The soldiers of Sparta were widely considered the greatest fighters of the ancient world, legendary for their heroic battle against the Persian invasion at Thermopylae. Yet the Spartan approach to battle was unorthodox. We are told counterintuitively that before the Spartans would enter into battle, their commanders would have musicians come and play soft, tranquilizing, serene music in order to calm them down before they went into battle. And the basic logic of this was the Spartans felt that, number one, to be brave in battle, you don't need anger. In order to kill, the Spartans tried to avoid the sin of anger, choosing instead to focus on calm determination. The evolution of the sin of anger would continue as Christianity became the dominant religion of the Roman Empire. There was much debate in this period over the sin of anger and its relationship to war. Some believed that war could be justified only if one was protecting the innocent. Others said any time anger resulted in war, it ran counter to the laws of God. There is no clear message about this in the Bible. In fact, history is rife with examples of terrible, destructive wars fought only as the result of the angry debate about religious views. People have never lacked justifications to kill. If they're religious, they'll use religious justifications. If they're nationalistic, they'll use nationalistic justifications. Today, the military view on anger is similar to the Spartan view. Marine First Sergeant William Beaudet has served three tours of combat duty. When we get ready to go into combat, 
We don't talk about the enemy to get fired up like before a, a football game. I'm not even worried about the enemy. I'm worried about my Marines. As long as I know that we're prepared ourselves, it doesn't matter who we fight. Well, I don't have to look at them as subhumans. Sergeant Baudet doesn't ever want to see the sin of anger boil over on the battlefield. I've actually had to pick up one of my Marines' hands that I found about 100 meters from where he died. You know, and was I mad? Oh, yeah. I was real mad. I was pissed off. But I refocused it onto something else and said, OK, this happened, now I got to focus on my job. Because if you let your emotions get to you while you're in combat, you're a dead man. To remove anger from the equation in battle, Marine recruits are subjected to extreme stress every day, beginning the day they join. This way, they learn how to refocus their emotions. I can honestly tell you this. Every time I've been in combat, I have never seen a United States Marine lose his temper and lose control. I've never seen it. Baudet believes that controlling anger gives his Marines the edge over the untrained troops they're battling. I've seen insurgents get mad, run out in the middle of the open, shoot, get angry, and, and think they're going to be a hero. And it doesn't work that way. They end up dead. Man has argued for thousands of years whether killing on the battlefield is a manifestation of the sin of anger. For Baudet, there is no question. Every time I went into combat, I believed every single time that while I was doing it that it was right. People may think it's murder. It's not murder. According to religious scholars, there is one key element missing. The thing about a soldier that's different than murder is he has no personal malice against the enemy, and he has nothing to gain from it. Murder, on the other side, is where I so hate you or don't want you or I want your money or something that I take your life from you. The sin of anger may have little to do with the justification for warfare. What about when anger erupts in our own backyard and results in homicide? Strangely enough, lawyers and neurologists both agree that sometimes murder can be forgiven. The seven deadly sins were compiled by the church as a guide of what to avoid on the path to heaven. The deadliest of these sins, the one that most often results in bloodshed, is the sin of anger. Throughout the history of America, there has actually been one perfectly acceptable reason to allow the manifestation of anger to result in murder. It is called a crime of passion. Generally, we think of crimes of passion as having to do with romantic relationships or marriage relationships. That's where you see the kind of anger, most often, that will generate very brutal violence. It was in 1859 in Washington, D.C., when the crime of passion first entered American public consciousness with the actions of wealthy and respected congressman Daniel Sickles. He discovered that his wife was having an affair with Philip Barton Key, who was the son of Francis Scott Key. And he just was so angry about it that he took out his pistols. He planned the murder. Armed with two pistols and accompanied by his best friend, Sickles confronted Philip Key on the streets of Washington, D.C. He shot him once in the chest, and then, while the wounded man pleaded for mercy, Sickles pumped two more bullets into him. The gunfire was so close to the White House that Sickles' friend, President James Buchanan, heard the shots. Sickles immediately confessed and went to jail. He was charged with first-degree murder, yet a team of top lawyers and several leading politicians agreed to serve as his defense attorneys. The crux of the defense was temporary insanity. 
they said it was possible under the law for a person to be temporarily incapable of knowing right from wrong. And after the crime is committed, all of a sudden they know right from wrong again. The jury acquitted Sickles. The public was more outraged by Sickles' forgiveness and reconciliation with his wife than by the murder and unorthodox acquittal. He was the first person in American history who successfully defended himself on the grounds of temporary insanity. I think he should have done time and plenty of it for what he did. But you get the feeling that many people feel that this kind of anger is understandable. They can imagine how they might feel if suddenly they were confronted with the fact that their spouse was unfaithful. The sins of Sickles would have a long-term effect on American law. In Texas, it was a law for a long time that if you caught your spouse in the act of having sex with someone else, you had the right to shoot that other person because their sense was that you would be so justifiably angry and so overwhelmed with rage that any normal person would kill in that circumstance. Some believe that the temporary insanity defense is nothing more than a clever trick, a legal loophole for succumbing to the sin of anger. Today, scientists are beginning to examine exactly where anger comes from. The brain perceives a lot of information, both from the outside world and from inside the body. And there is one part of the brain called the amygdala that serves the function of sifting through all that information and asking one question. Is this a threat? Is this something I should worry about? Dr. Ruben Gur has zeroed in on the amygdala as the key instigator of anger. This walnut-sized lobe can quickly overwhelm the brain with uncontrollable rage. Once there is a perception of danger, there is a cascade of responses in the body that includes changes in heart rate, in blood pressure, in sweating. It makes your body ready to fight or flee. The amygdala is a primitive part of the brain. It exists because the human brain is made up of layers that were added on top of each other over the millions of years of evolution. All those other older brains are still alive and well inside your own brain. So you have a part of you that thinks like a dog, and you have a part of you that thinks like a crocodile, and a part of you that thinks like a monkey. The amygdala creates an automatic fight or flight response to threats. But human beings have evolved another part of the brain, the frontal lobes. This area that you can see here in the front is the orbital frontal region. And the orbital frontal regions are like brakes for the amygdala. If you can think of the amygdala as being the engine for the threat response, the orbital frontal is the brakes. If Dr. Gur is correct, then a person who is overwhelmed by anger is literally temporarily insane until his amygdala can be controlled. Case in point, the 2003 murder of Betty Dodge by her son, James Essek. At the time of the crime, Essek was an adult with mental problems who had moved in with his mother. Their relationship deteriorated so badly that Dodge asked her son to move out. And that set him into a panic. And he grabbed a sculpture that they had and broke it on her head and kept hitting her repeatedly until she was dead. And then he went across the street, turned himself into the police. During the court case, Dr. Gurr was hired as an expert witness and asked to evaluate the mental capacity of Essek. He did a complete neuroscan of his brain and found that 30 to 40% of the tissue was missing in the orbital frontal area. So when the amygdala was saying, I'm in danger, I'm furious, 
attack. There was not enough tissue in the front to say, calm down. You have better ways of dealing with this situation than attacking what you think is the source of your fear and anger. The jury agreed with Dr. Gurr's testimony and ruled that James Essek was innocent by reason of insanity. He was sent to a mental hospital for treatment. Some might say James Essek was incapable of controlling his ability to sin. The organ of our mind and what controls our behavior is the brain, and his brain is damaged. But by the time an angry act results in prison or a mental hospital, the damage is done. Is there a way to treat human rage before it gets to this critical breaking point? The seven deadly sins have guided Christian thought for centuries. And while there are consequences for the sins of lust, greed, envy, pride, gluttony, and sloth, Perhaps the deadliest consequences come from the sin of anger. When we're angry, we lose control. When we're angry, we border on the possibility of physical violence. When we fall into the passion of anger, we lose ourselves. But part of the temptation of anger is that, ironically, anger is very satisfying. It can bring people all the way to euphoria, uh, especially men. Uh, a lot of times, it's good to feel angry. And despite centuries of religious attempts to control the sin of anger, today, it is everywhere. I'd like to think that faith would deter violence and help us manage our anger. But the fact is the United States has the highest rate of church attendance in the affluent world, the highest rate of belief in God, and we have by far the highest murder rate. The concept of the sin of anger has evolved over the centuries. Christian theology once said that those who commit the sin face the eternal fires of hell. But there are some sinners who are tormented by anger even in this life. I was in a relationship. Things didn't go well, to sum it up. And didn't know how to handle it. Went and bought two uh, gallons of gasoline. Broke out the windows in the middle of the daytime. I live in an apartment complex. Filled her car up with gas, set it on fire, blew up the car in an underground parking garage. The whole place had to be evacuated. And I could have killed hundreds of people. I snapped. I beat them up. B bad enough for the courts to say, you know what, five years, prison time. These men aren't dealing with their sin through confession and repentance, but through anger management. The sin of anger is so widespread in society that the concept of anger management has entered the pop culture lexicon. Anutza Bellissimo is a specialist who has treated thousands of people with anger issues. Anger in today's society, I believe, is a very serious issue. Looking at one simple statistic of 18,000 assaults being reported per week in the US, I think anger is definitely an issue. Bellissimo says that anger is not a deadly sin, but an inappropriate behavior. I do not believe you can get rid of anger. I feel that anger is a very necessary human emotion. For me, anger is a red flag. For me, anger is a way of acknowledging that there's things that I'm not dealing with. Experts say that the key to overcoming anger is less about controlling rage and more about creating connections. If you tell them this anger is destroying your relationship with your wife or your children, that seems to work. Having a relationship, that's what humanity is all about, our connection to each other. Tradition claims that the sin of anger is punishable by eternal damnation. 
But Bellissimo feels this religious approach is useless in the modern world. I've never been able to scare any angry students from being angry because they would go to hell. I've never been able to use that as a tool. But there are some who would argue that point. One is a man named Howard Storm, who feels he has learned the demonic power of the sin of anger. In 1985, Howard Storm was a 38-year-old art professor with a serious anger problem. I never hurt my wife or my kids, but I would yell and scream at them. I would toss the kitchen table, which was loaded for dinner, you know, toss the table and all of its contents across the room and smash things and things like that. But while on a trip to Paris, Howard Storm found himself in a hospital emergency room, dying of a perforated intestine. As he drifted in and out of consciousness, he realized he was not alone. What I experienced was, at first, people outside the room calling me by name to come with them. And I said, are you from the doctor? I'm very sick. I'm supposed to have surgery. And they said, hurry up. We know all about you. We don't have time for your questions. Come with us. In a half-awake state, Storm was led down a long hallway. Suddenly, without warning, he was viciously attacked from all sides. Only at this point did he realize he was no longer in a real hospital. I'm fighting as hard as I can fight, the best I can fight to basically just defend myself. I'm just trying to keep from being hit, scratched, bitten, pushed, kicked. And it's coming from every direction in this darkness. There aren't words to describe this. Scary, terrifying, horrible are all completely inadequate. At this point, Storm did something that this atheist had never considered before. He began to pray. A beam of light appeared and delivered him from the attackers. He found himself back in his hospital room, alive once again. Howard Storm believes there was only one explanation for this near-death experience. In a way, I think of it as an opportunity. I was given the opportunity to experience hell. And once he had recovered from his medical ordeal, Storm felt he had the opportunity to change his relationship with the sin of anger. Ever since my near-death experience, I've never had that kind of raging, that out-of-control anger. I've never experienced that since. Whether Storm's experience was a literal trip to hell or simply a terrifying hallucination, it had a profound effect on him, transforming his relationship with his wife, his family, and his own emotions. Storm feels that his Dante-like experience, recalling a medieval version of the evolution of anger, might have some benefit to others. One of the things that drives me to be perfectly honest, is that I don't want anybody to go to hell. And I'm on a mission from God to keep people from going to hell. The sin of anger has evolved over the millennia, from the wrath of a just God in the book of Genesis to the forgiveness of Jesus in the gospel, from Dante's punishments in hell to the court-ordered attempts to manage the deadly sin. Is the sin of anger the deadliest of the seven sins? The answer may not matter, for in the end, we will all be judged, some by our peers, some by a higher power. And for those tormented by the sin of anger, the sin itself may be enough to create hell on Earth.